How good is it to be the house of the Lord? Welcome, find your seat, guys. We are ready to worship, okay? So get your last coffee till it's finishing it up now, and we're ready to worship the Lord in this house. Enjoy.
Church, yes, we are risen with him. He is alive, he lives in us, he's here with us. And uh, the next song is quite declarative. And it reminded me of the one story in the Bible. It's when uh, the disciples were on the boat and then a storm came and there were waves and uh, they came to Jesus who was sleeping in the back and they say, come on, don't you care that we, we drown? We are about to drown right now. And, and he, he told them, where is your faith? And it's as if that they totally forgot all the miracles that they saw be before and they were in the middle of something. They were like, no, that's too big for him. We need to, you need to do something. We are, we are dying right now. And I wonder if sometimes we also we are in the same situation and God can ask us, where is your faith? So if it's your case today, I want you to, I encourage you to come to Jesus and to declare that yes, you can calm the storm in me, you can silence the fear in me, and whatever difficulties you are going through, I know that Jesus is with you right now, and he will be with you, and he will strengthen you, and, and yes, he will calm the storm in our situation. So let's think of, yeah, what we are going through and declare with faith that yes, Jesus, you can calm the storm in me. We call upon your name. We call on the name of Jesus, the name above every name. There is no other name. Oh Lord, we glorify you. We worship you.
Come on, church. Your name cannot be
exhausted, if we're tired, if we're stressed, if we feel anxiety, we, we can just come here to you and lay it all down. And Church, um, this morning I was reading the verse of the day, and it's the verse of the day, but it still counts, okay? And this just reminded me so much, and it says this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. To make it more 2022, it's some trust in, in their savings and in their career, but we trust in the name of our Lord. Some trust in social media and likes, but, but we trust in the name of our Lord, our God. Come on, somebody. Hey, some trust in the world and our career and jobs and securities, but we can trust in our Lord, our God. And, and I just want to encourage you as we start the service, as you are in worship, as you're praying, God, we can trust in you. And as Laura said, sometimes it's like a, like a storm outside. Sometimes it's loud. Sometimes it's, we can get nervous. But, but in your presence, Lord, in your presence, Lord, there's where we find peace, where we find silence, where we find rest, Lord. And we just thank you for that. Thank you that this is a place where you are and this is a place where you give us rest and peace. Thank you, Lord. In your mighty name. Hey guys, and we have a very special treat for you right now because we have some very special people doing our family time. So please give a hand for Kira and Yuna right now. Good morning, I'm Kira. And I'm Yuna, we're doing family time today. We have lots of exciting things to tell you about, but first we have a very special day on Thursday. Would you like to tell us why, Yuna? No school. Yes, we did have no school, but we also had Father's Day. How did you celebrate Father's Day, Yuna? I was extra nice to my dad. I gave him a present and I told him how much I love him. How about you, Kira? My dad was traveling this week, but I made him a card and we made him a very nice dinner on Thursday evening. That sounds very fun. We wanted to say Happy Father's Day to all of the dads. We love you and we hope you had an amazing day. <laughs> Did you realize we have another long weekend next weekend, Yuna? That's right! It's Pentecost weekend. No school on Monday. It's also, it is also a very special Sunday for us. It's our t church's 10th birthday. <laughs> yeah! We will have a special service with lots of fun, including a panel all about remembering God's faithfulness and stepping out in faith. You know, did you realize that 10 years ago, we weren't even born? <laughs> I know, 10 years is a long time. One of the things I'm thankful for is because of this church, we became friends. I'm thankful for that too. 
and for the many other people we have got to meet and become friends with over the years. So whenever you've been part of this church since it started about 10 years ago, or you have just joined us recently, you are invited to come along and celebrate. We would also like to invite you along to our worship night this Thursday here at church. The doors will open at 6.30 p.m. and the worship will start at 7 p.m. I don't know about you, but I love worshiping and singing to God. It is a very special, it is always so special, so come along on Thursday to join everybody. Yeah, you should totally go along. We will probably be getting ready for bed, but for all of you grown-ups, you should totally jo go. You should. Worshiping is the best. If you want to be part of making our worship and church service happening, then you can also go along to your gate, which is every Thursday from 6.30 p.m. There, here you can learn all about our different teams like singing, band, and production. Even if you're not sure you can do those things, then you can still come and the people there can help you teach you and show you all you need to know. Another way you can help build our church is through giving your thighs. Hides, okay, I'm having trouble with that word. When we give to church, we can pay our church rent. We have all the equipment we need and that people can work behind the scenes to make church happen. We are very thankful for everyone that gives. We, If you would like to give, then you can find our bank details on the church website or you can put your cash into the offering box at the back of the room when you leave. We are very grateful for you giving because this means we have a space every Sunday where we can learn more about God and spend with time with our friends. We love that we can be here in church. We do. In Kids Club, we've been learning about heroes in the Bible. My favorite so far is Esther, and I've lived, I love learning about Ruth. I hear the grown-ups are also going to study one of the heroes we've learned about. That's right! Today is the start of the series on my favorite Bible hero, Esther. The preaching series called Beyond Me because Esther realized that she, what she did and how she acted affect more people than just her. She affected the whole nation. That's like us influencing all of Germany. That's a lot of people. Esther was a very brave woman and we, can, we have a lot we can learn from her and how much she trusted God. We now want to invite Pastor Laura up to the stage to begin our Esther series with a preach about finding God in the here and now. We will see you soon, and we hope you enjoyed our family event and that you enjoy the preach too. Bye! Bye. Wow, didn't they do an amazing job? That's one of the ways you, you notice really like the years going by. You see our kids growing up. When Yuna, when we first became part of this church, Yuna and Kira were about half a year old. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. It's just so good to see them growing up and growing up in the house of the Lord. Um, can you guys believe it? Ten years, ten years of this church started out as Hope City, Frankfurt, now C3 Frankfurt. 
what we've been through together as a church family. And still, you know, some of those original people are around in here and still part of church. But I want to, I wonder, what were you doing 10 years ago? Can you remember, like, you know, what were you, where were you? Where did you live in the world? Because, you know, many of us didn't even live in Frankfurt at that time. You know, for Eddie and I, it was actually one of, we were going through one of the hardest seasons of our lives so far. Um, And it was nine years ago that we became part of this church and this family. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, You know, we were a full year, about about a year, with no church home. Um, we, We just had... Like I said, it had been through one of the hardest seasons of our lives, and we were just far from church. Not far from God, um, but far from church. And at some point, we felt like, okay, we need to go to church again. And honestly, guys, my biggest motivation to start going back to church is I want my kids to grow up in church. I mean, it's probably going to be good for me too, but I want my kids to know that I'm not crazy for believing in Jesus. I'm not like an oddball. They need to be around other people of faith. And that at some point, you know, the, the boys were, you know, starting to like 9, 10, you know, getting near those preteen years. I was like, they're going to need other Christians than, you know, their parents to speak into their lives. And that's been such a blessing here in this um, community to see how they have um, grown and really thrived. Um, yeah, it's just incredible. You know, and when we started coming to this, coming here to this church, you know, it was like the kids were happy. We could sit in the service. It was like, okay. It felt like it just works out, you know, and there was like no big plan behind it, no big um you know, no big idea. We had, didn't have like, you know, the five, ten-year plan set out at that time. We're going to join this church, and then this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. We just kind of started hap- coming here. In some ways, it was, um, you know, not what we were intending. And you could say it just kind of all worked out, you know, the way things have worked out for our family being part of this church. But that's kind of the point of what we're going to be talking about today is do things really just kind of work out, <laughs> you know? Like, have you ever, like, had something happen, like, oh, that was really lucky, or what a coincidence? And, you know, sometimes it's, like, little and frivolous things, and sometimes it's the bigger decisions of life. And the question is, is it really just things just kind of work out, or is there, can we see in these things the hand of God working his, um, working his purposes behind the scenes? Today, um, as the girls let us know, we're starting um, a series on the book of Esther. And we've been wanting to do this for a while, like as, um, you know, we were preparing for it, we're really excited for it. Um, And, you know, we realized in the, in the preparations, I was really looking, okay, how do we, how do we like organize the sermons? What do we preach about? Um, Often when we do a book study, we'll just go through chapter by chapter, section by section, just kind of work our way through the book. Um, We've done this um, recently with the book of John where we just kind of worked our way. We pulled out a few stories. We're like, we're going to study the book of John. And we realized as we were preparing that this really doesn't work so well for the book of Esther. Because while the book of Esther is a story, and if you've read it, you'll know it's a very dramatic and um, at times very interesting story, um, it doesn't make sense to if you look at just the beginning without knowing how it ends up. And so today, I have two purposes, two things that I would like for us to get out of this um, time together. And that's, um, one, to kind of set the stage, give the overview of the book of Esther, and then to talk a little bit about how does it relate to now. Is this book that was written about events that happened to about 2,500 years ago, is it relevant to us today. So first, a little bit of historical context. Um, We have a map to show you. And this is the map of the Persian Empire um, about the time that our story takes place. And um, you can see they had been expanding. Um, The Jews had been taken a couple generations beforehand into exile. And in fact, 
um, we're going to shortly meet King Xerxes, who was the king at this time. And it was his father and grandfather had already started allowing Jews to move back. But it was still kind of um, owned or kind of controlled by all of it by, by Persia. And our story happens here in Susa, in the capital at, at that time, the capital of the Persian Empire. And so I'm going to just start by reading the first couple of verses of the book of Esther, because this sets the stage for our story. It says in Esther 1.1, 1, 1, It was in the days of Asursus, or Xerxes, who reigned from India, to, from India to Ethiopia, as we saw, he had all of this area, over 127 provinces. In those days, when King Ahursus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa, in the third year of his reign, he held a banquet for all of his officials and attendants, the army, of per the army officers of Persia and Media. And the nobles and the officials of the provinces were there in his presence. And he displayed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. So the scene opens, we get reference, you know, we see this is the extent of the Persian Empire. We're at the capital. The king, he's throwing this big banquet. So what do we know about the king, this king? So, you know, as we said, as I said, you know, he, his father and grandfather had already allowed many Jews to return. Um, you know, the ones that were still, there were still Jews in the scattered throughout the Persian Empire, whether they had just chosen to say, whether it was too complicated for them to go back, we don't really know. But he, Xerxes, we meet him here, and he's throwing a banquet for 180 days, half a year of a banquet. And he's most likely gathering all of his officials and nobles, it says, for the purpose of getting them ready. He wants to go out to war. He wants to attack Greece, okay? And this first kind of bit of information places it at, at the specific time when he's probably start at the start of his reign and he's gathering his people. And readers that were more closer to the events would realize right away the first bit of irony um, in this story is that he was gathering and showing off all of this luxury and like w look at all of this stuff that we have. And of course, we're going to go on this you know military venture and we're going to go and conquer Greece and looking back, they were actually not successful, and it cost him a lot of his riches in the end. But, you know, right now we're before this, and he's, you know, gathering his troops, trying to raise morale and get people excited about going. The next kind of important person that we meet, and even though she has a very, um, is only mentioned briefly, she has a very important role, and that's Queen Vashti. And in Esther 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 10. It says, on the seventh day, when the king's heart was joyful with wine. So he had, he had this first banquet for 180 days. And then he had a second banquet that was seven days long. Um, I don't know. It seems a bit short in comparison. But on the seventh day, when the king's heart was joyful with wine, he commanded um, the seven eunuchs. I'm going to skip all of their names. I'm sorry. <laughs> The seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Hazusas to bring Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown to display her beauty before the people and the officials, for she was lovely to see. But Vashti refused. She refused to come at the king's command, which was delivered to her by the eunuchs. So the king became extremely angry and burned with rage. Now, there are several very interesting theories about why Vashti would have refused the king's request. And I think today we would say any of them were valid going back to she didn't want to. And so why should she just go at the king's um, call? Why should she have to jump every time he called? But that wasn't kind of the role or how women were treated at the time. Um, and one commentator on the book of Esther says... Um, about kind of the role of women at this time, it, what is significant and most oppressive is that their will, whatever it might have been, is of no interest to anyone in the story. They are handed around from home to harem to the king's bed. Their bodies belong to others. And so this was what was expected of women. They were just kind of passed around. They were expected to do whatever was asked of them and whatever was required of them. 
And so here we see a woman standing up for herself. Um, and it comes at a cost to her in the end because um, the king then in his anger called, called his officials and was like, what do we do about this? How, can, how should I respond? What's an appropriate response? And he said, like, uh, you know, it's not really that big deal. Like, no, for them it really was a big deal. And so they said, okay, you need to cut her off. She's never to be, see the king again. She loses her title of queen. And, you know, so that's what they did. And this kind of opens the door for in the next chapter, the king starting to think about, okay, what did I do now? I don't have a queen. Hmm, this is a problem. And opens the door for the next kind of set sequence of events in Esther 2. Picking it up in verse 5. There was a certain Jew in the citadel whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemo, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite who had been deported from Jerusalem with the captives and who had been exiled with Jenokah, king of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had exiled. He was the guardian of Hadassah, that is Esther, the uncle's daughter, for she had no father or mother. The young woman was beautiful of form and face, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her in as her own daughter. So here we're introduced to the next two important people in the story, Mordecai, um, who was a Jew, and we get his, you know, his lineage, which for us, again, is like a list of names, but I want to point out something very interesting about it in just a moment. And we get to meet Esther. Um, all right, so Mordecai, we get this list of names, and we're going to see it up here, right? He's a son of Jerash, son of Shemo, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Um, if any of you are Bible scholars, maybe one of these b names is ringing a bell, Kish. Kish. Kish was also the father of Saul, the first king of the Israelites. So Mordecai is of this line of people, and now he finds himself, this is his lineage. And we understand when the Bible often says the son of the son of, it doesn't mean that this was just three generations back, but it means that this was his lineage. This is whom he was descended. So he had the same kind of lineage and descent as King Saul the first um, anointed king of Israel who, um, if you remember, lost his anointing at one, pla at one point and was replaced by David. And so this is Mordecai. And Mordecai finds himself in the heart, not just in Persia, but in the heart of Persia. And he serves at the temple. He's basically serving at the royal palace, right? This is his job. He has, um, you know, he's you know, working there kind of on the inside. And he's taken in his orphaned cousin. So Esther is his cousin. She's orphaned because, as we've seen, women have absolutely no rights and no say. They always need a man to be kind of in charge of or responsible for them. And Mordecai has taken that role for Esther. You know, and what's interesting is that, you know, if you know the stories of Daniel, maybe a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were also part of, like, in this kingdom. And when Daniel came in, he was like, you know, don't... I would need to be, you know, treat me differently, give me a different food. You know, he made all these things. And he was like, this is my heritage. This is my, the teachings of, you know, the Jews as I need to hold to this. And Mordecai and Esther had a very different strategy. They were basically blending in. They had assimilated into the local culture. And basically, and Mordecai had instructed Esther, you know, they changed her name. And he instructed her, don't let them know who you really are. Before we are too hard on them for doing that, we will see in the course of the story that when it really comes down to it, when it really matters, they do stand up and uh, reveal who they are. Okay, so we have Mordecai and Esther. And next, we get to meet Haman. And this is in the start of chapter 3. Um, and so th there's, you know, a bunch more events and drama we'll talk about a little bit more in, as we go on. But Haman... Um, basically comes into the picture as this person that um, King Xerxes is promoting to be um, kind of over the kingdom. He gives him his ring. He's like, you're in charge. So after these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the officials that were with him. Okay, guys, this is something I found super interesting, and I kind of nerded out a over a little bit as I was preparing. Um, if we see now Haman, some of 
Hamadetha, okay? The Agagite. So the Agagite comes from Agag, who was an Amalekite. Okay, so there's two things about, first, about the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the people, you remember, if you, kn if you know some of the Bible stories, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, Moses had led them out of Egypt, right? And he sends out, they get there, right? They're at the edge of the promised land with Moses, and he sends out the spies. You remember? The spies to check out the land, and they come back, you know, and, you know, the t 10 of them are like, you know, it's great land, but, you know, it's inhabited by, among other people, the Amalekites, um, and all these other people, and there's no way. And it's only Joshua and Caleb who stand up and say. And then, like in this time where they're like, all the Israelites are doubting and everything, there's a tribe or two tribes of people that come in and really attack the Israelites and cause a lot of damage. And that was the Amalekites and the Canaanites. Okay, so there is a long history of fighting between these two peoples. Okay, and then Agag, I remember I just re reminded us about King Saul. And if you remember, why did King Saul lose his anointing? So if you don't know, it's fine. If Maybe if you've like studied this stuff and you got to kind of get into it and get excited about it, like I kind of do sometimes. <laughs> but King Saul, he, God gave him specific instructions to fight against a group of people the Amalekites, of whom Agag was at the time the king. And Saul did not kill Agag as he was supposed to. He defeated the Amalekites, but he didn't kill the king. He allowed him to live. And so that Saul ended up losing his anointing. Um, but it's not just that they were Israelites and Amalekites. It's also this part of their family tree, Saul and Agag, right? They were already fighting generations ago. And so this has progressed. And I don't, maybe it's not crucial to the whole story. I just found it fascinating. And it's one of those things like, wow, this is still got how God brings this up and how, you know, the you know, people who are reading the story, there are names and things that we just kind of gloss over, but there's something to it. There's a reason it's there. So the next thing I want to talk about is kind of the structure of the book as a whole. Um, because it's really interesting. It has a lot of irony in it. And it's basically the fancy word for this that I, I actually learned this word because I'm not a literary person is chiasm. Okay? Basically, in my more mathematical thinking mind, I was like, oh, it has mirror symmetry, <laughs> is how I thought of it. <laughs> um, but we have an image, and you're not going to be able to see all of this. But basically, this is to show that we have some events. At the beginning, we have the two great feasts that I talked about. And at the end, very end in chapters 9 and 10, there's, a two, again, two great feasts of the Jews. And all of the events kind of that happen here are paralleled on the other side. And that's why, you know, it does, it's hard to talk about these things without seeing, okay, it works out. How does it work out? And there's in, right in the middle, there's a pivot point. Okay, there's a point where the story pivots and things start to change. So we have here, you know, Haman rising in power. And then he um, wants everyone to bow down to him. And this is the first one I'm going to call Mordecai moment. Where Mordecai, even though he's kind of fitting into his society and he's, you know, hiding his true identity, he refuses to bow down to Haman. And, you know, and whether it's because, okay, because you're, you know, this lineage and, like, there's no way I could ever bow to you or because it's, you know, God has said you will bow before no one. He doesn't bow before him. And so Haman is mad. And Haman figures out that Mordecai is a Jew, and he's like, you know what? This is enough of this, like, years-long rivalry. We're gonna just going to wipe them all out. And he has the king issue an edict, right? Um, <clears throat> then we see... In yeah, in between, shortly before that, actually, yeah, okay, never mind. There's a lot that happens, a lot of twists and turns. Um, the edict is set, and Mordecai comes to Esther and says, you know, look, this is the time, that the, you know, the famous line, you know, if you don't, 
stand up and do what's right now, you know, someone else will come, but who should know if for such a time as this, you're in this place. And Esther has to make a choice because, up okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But basically, we see a lot of events that have been set in motion. Mordecai serving in the palace, this, um, Haman elevated to power the decree, Mordecai and Esther's plan to reverse things. And even, even these things that seem to be so desperate and so, um, like, how could this be? This is, like, totally not working in our favor. Even these things God is using to work out his, um, to work out his purposes. So even though there's no mention of God's name in this whole book, and that's one of the other remarkable things about the book of Esther, is God's name is never mentioned. But we see his hand clearly. right? And what is this pivotal moment? What is the pivotal moment? The moment is the king is, Esther invites the king and Haman to two feasts. And in between these two feasts, so Esther's, first banquet and Esther's second banquet. And in between, the king is having a hard time sleeping. And he calls, and he says, calls on someone to read him kind of the annal of what has happened in the kingdom, what's, you know, and they just happen. So the king happens to not be able to sleep, and he happens to call on someone to read him the annals of what the things that have happened in the kingdom. And they happen to just read the part about when Mordecai uncovered a plot against the king and saved the king's life, basically. And the king is like, oh, wait a minute. That happened. Oh, yeah. You know, I kind of forgot about that. But this was really important in that culture that that person, because, you know, he saved the king's life, so the king is kind of indebted to him. So what was ever done for him? And then the person reads it, mm, doesn't say here. Apparently nothing was done for him. So this is a problem. The king feels like he needs to make it right. And he's like, okay, who's, who can I ask? Who is in the court? Just happens to be Haman who has come actually because he's like there first thing in the morning. He's like, it's enough. I've had enough of Mordecai. I'm going to him first thing in the morning, and I'm going to ask him to just let me end Mordecai's life. And as it happens, the king, um, you know, said, oh, send Haman in. He's here. Let me talk to him. And the king, before Mordecai gets, uh, before Haman gets a chance to give his um, request, you know, a king asks him, so what would you do to honor someone whom you wanted to give much honor to? And Haman, of course, thinks that it's himself. Who else would the king want to honor other than himself? And so he thinks up the most lavish and, you know, things, you know, that what the king could do. Um, and the king says, this is the great pivot and the great irony in this story where it all turns around. He says, the king says to Haman, go and do this for Mordecai. And from that moment where it switches, Haman, instead of getting, instead of Mordecai bowing down to Haman, he has to honor Mordecai. And everything starts to play out in, you know, in the, Basically, the tables are turned and things start going differently. Esther pushes us, and this is um, this amazing graphic that we just saw, by the way. It was from the Bible Project. And um, if you don't know, they just have great videos. They kind of give an overview of, I think, all of the books of the Bible. But that's a great, concise look at the book. And in their blog about the book, they say, Esther pushes us to look at our own lives and consider how God might be actively working behind the scenes, even in the face of great threat or tragedy, to accomplish his work and his perfect purposes. We're called to trust in God's providence, even when we can't see it working or don't understand what's happening. The message calls us to deeper levels of faith, where we choose to believe that no matter how horrible things get, God is committed to redeeming his good world and overcoming evil. So when we look at our own lives, when you look back over the last couple of years that have been so difficult, can you see how God has been working out his purposes? Can you look back further 
and see how really, you know, from your early days, God has been working together his purposes in your life. He's been working things together that somehow you ended up here this morning, here in this place, in living in Frankfurt, in the job that you are in, in the family that you're in, in all of these things. Can you see how he's been working behind the scenes? And I think this is one of the main points of Esther. They don't talk openly about God, but there is no doubt that God is at work. Can all of these things just happen by chance? Some would say, yeah, they could. They could all just happen by chance. Um, but a much better explanation in my mind is that it's really the hand of God working through people. And yet, on the other hand, the people in the story are active. They're making decisions. They're choosing when to hide and when to reveal themselves, when to stand up. They're brave, and they choose to do what is right when it's hard and when it could have um, very bad and negative consequences for them. And so it's kind of this together, working together of the people doing their part, making the decisions, making the choices, choosing to stand up, and God orchestrating events behind the scenes. So, but again, how does this apply to us even more? You know, in the city of Susa, 2,500 years ago, Susa was actually, they, th they found archaeological facts that people, even 4,000 B.C., this place was started to be inhabited. And it's probably one, one of the places, cities on the earth that's been continuously inhabited since then. But these people, like particularly at this time, fi around 500 B.C., it was you know, kind of the middle of the Persian Empire. As we see, the Persian Empire, they had taken over different peoples. And so you had a lot of different peoples and cultures living in this city. It was a very profitable place to be. There's a reason that, you know, people have been living there all these times. They were, you know, able to um, farm in the surrounding areas and to, um, you know, how are ma making money. It was, like, you know, profitable to be there. Alexander the Great, apparently, when he did... Um, come and conquer Susa, which is amazed by the amount of riches there. So it's basically a meeting place of people from the known regions of the world at that time. You know, financially successful, perhaps a hub. Um, you know, they had their own gods, but they allowed people to kind of worship however they wanted to, um, as long as when you were required to, you bowed down to the king or to his officials. And while it was diverse, Esther and Mordecai felt the need to hide their identity. And so I just see, you know, in this city, it's like a metropolitan of Susa. There's so many similarities to Frankfurt, isn't there? Like when you think about it, right? And I think it can be really easy to be hard on them and to think, Okay, well, we're, we are so much more advanced than they were. And in some ways, we are. But in some ways, we still have a lot of the same issues. You know, like I said, there's a reason Mordecai and Esther felt like they had to choose hide their identity. And I'm sure that race and the different ethnicities being present there was a cause for conflict at times, as we see, you know, how easily the king went along with the plan of killing off one whole people group. So <laughs> it was obviously an issue in their society. But if there was any doubt that race is also an issue in our society, I think that was those doubts might were laid to rest a couple of years ago with the events um, surrounding the killing of George Floyd that it was almost exactly two years ago now, and the riots that were not just in the US, but all over the world. And while we recognize the issues here in Germany are very different from the U.S. The U.S. has its own set of issues that they're dealing with or need to be dealing with. It doesn't mean that it's not an issue here. And, you know, it's not always clear what exactly the issues are, but, you know, let's figure it out. And let's not be afraid to look at this. And in the meantime, we're, we're figuring out the, the, the things on the societal level and what we can do to, to address these issues. 
I'd like this to be a place, our church to be a place where we can talk about these things and where we're a community that values people in the fullness of who you are. Now, I, I don't see you completely. I'm just going to pretend part of you doesn't exist. We see you in the completeness, in the fullness of who you are. And you know what? There's a really simple and easy way to start, and that's by getting to know people, getting to know their faces and their names. When you look at someone and you know who they are and you know their name, For some of us, it's the first time we've been in such an international community. You know, some of us are used to it and feel much more comfortable here in an international community than we do anywhere else. You know, but for all of us, it takes a little bit of extra effort to get to know people who are different from ourselves. But let's do it. Let's say, I value you as the child of God that um, is created by him. You know, don't be afraid to ask someone their name. You know, don't be afraid, even if, like, guys, I'm not great with names. I'm going to admit it. You know, and it can be embarrassing sometimes. But if we can just say, look, I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. I'm not going to mix you up with somebody else because I know you and who you are. <laughs> I was, as I was, you know, thinking this through, I was, I remembered, like, the woman who has been my best friend now for 25 years, for the first couple of months, she called me Beth. The first couple of months, we knew each other. She just called me Beth. Neither one of us has any idea why, but at some point, she figured out my real name, that I wasn't Beth, I was Laura. And since then, we've been friends. But let's get to know each other's names. Let's get to know and see each other in the fullness of who we are and who God has created us to be. And one more word. This really struck me this time as I was preparing, and it's... Um, you know, back from the second chapter, when it talks about Esther, we introduce her. She's with Mordecai. And it says, Esther was taken. And, you know, like the girl said, like Esther is one of the stories we tell to our kids. You know, we've all heard this before. Do we realize what that means? Esther was taken. She didn't go because she was like, yeah, I volunteer. She was taken. She was trafficked. This was an issue then. People would just be, and it wasn't just Esther. They estimate, the estimates of, it was between 400 and 1,400 women, young women, who were gathered up at the whim of the king and taken to him. This is horrific. Okay, and what these women had to go through because they had no will of their own. And like the quote I read at the beginning is that we sometimes overlook that fact because they just had no say and no will, right? But they were trafficked. This was happening. And it wasn't only women. Men, just the same, would be gathered up and made to be eunuchs in the king's palace. I don't think any men would actually volunteer for that position. Um, but they were taken and they had to do it. And before we think, oh my gosh, the Persian Empire was so atrocious, and it was, we need to come to grips with the fact that, according to some estimates, there are over 40, people milli 40 million people in um, slavery today. Not in the Persian Empire today. There are 40 million people in some kind of slavery. It's an estimate by the A21 network, which some of you may know is a network, a Christian network that works to educate and to end human trafficking. And so, you know, for all the advancements that we've made, we still have so many similarities to Persia. And what can we do? And because this can all feel so overwhelming, and I, you know, often myself feel so powerless. Let's just start in our own day to day, you know, getting to know our community, building up our community, and supporting these organizations that fight human trafficking. It's the A21. There's um, clothing brands more and more now that are supporting um, people who are coming out of trafficking and making sure that their products are um, not supporting 
the trafficking industries. And so let's just try to you know, be aware and see what are the little things that I can do to make a difference. And when an opportunity presents itself, will we be ready to stand up? So we're going to wrap up now. Melissa's going to come up and um, join and play some little background music. But let me ask you to think about this this morning. Are you hiding? Are you hiding right now? Maybe there's a reason. You know, there was a reason Mordecai and Esther were hiding at the beginning of the story. But when it was the right time, you know, Esther... Throughout the story, you know, she was taken. She did everything. Like, basically, she was the complacent, obedient woman that was expected of her. Until that moment in that back and forth between her and Mordecai, which for the most part didn't happen directly. It was like through messengers. And she took a stand, and she started giving Mordecai instructions She's like, okay, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to do what you asked me to do, then I need you to tell all the people to pray and fast with me. This isn't only about me. This is beyond me. And then she went and she put her life and her future at risk by going before the king. When it was the right time, she came out of hiding and she stood up for what she believed in. So I just want to ask you to reflect on that this morning. What are those moments, those Mordecai moments, when it's the right moment for us to stand up? To let everybody know, this is who I am and this is what I believe. When you choose not to go the way of the world and you choose to say, this is this is how I'm going to live because this is what Jesus is calling me to. And I believe that he has my best interests in mind and that as I follow him on this path, he's going to work things out. And even when it looks dark and it looks like everything is against me, he's actually behind the scenes and he's working things out. And it's my part just to take one more step, one more step of faithfulness, one more step of obedience. Ephesians 4, 1, Paul encourages us, and he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, he's in prison. He said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You have received a calling. And when your moment comes, will you be ready? Will you be ready to stand for what you believe in when it goes against what is expected of you and what society all around us is telling you is normal? You know, in the coming weeks, we're going to dive into some of these ideas even more deeply about, you know, being faithful when we don't hear directly from God and um, <clears throat> about you know, building community that it's not just one person in isolation working. It was a whole community. But today, I want you to take some time to reflect right now. Do you see the way that God is at work in your life? Do you see his hand working things out behind the scenes? And how he's fitting all the pieces together, the pieces that don't make sense to you. But he's somehow working to fit them all together. And are you ready? Are you ready to take a stand? Are you ready to take a stand and stand up for what you know is right when the time comes? We're going to pray and then um, the band is going to come up. We're going to close with a song just to give us some time to reflect and to continue praying. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that um, you are indeed behind the scenes and you are working your purposes out in our lives. And as we look at when we're honest, we can see your hand, how you've brought us from one place to the next and how you have carried us. And even in the dark times that you've been there and you're working things out. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that we get to have a part with you in it, God. And I pray that you give each and every one of us the courage and the faith that we need to stand up to the fullness of who we are in you. To stand up for it. 
to say, this is who I am and this is what I believe. Thank you that ultimately even that courage, Lord, it comes from you. And we trust you with that this morning. Amen. sang it already, but sometimes when we've sung a song and sing it again, then it helps to sing it like word by word. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been placing your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. you praise, Lord, in this place. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Laura, for bringing the word. I'm excited for the series of Esther. So many facts, and we are so glad that you spoke to us. Hey, for everyone, just stick around. Uh, get a coffee. Till is ready. Hang around. We want to get to know you, get to know the name, get to know the face, okay? Uh, I have my brothers with us as well. But just hang around, get to know us. We can get to know you, and have a lovely Sunday. See you next.